Hey, what's up? It's Cliff. So I got to speak to Dr. Stornetta, and we had a great talk, and I got some valuable insights about the future of Bitcoin and blockchains. So if you don't know who he is, he and Dr. Stuart Haber worked on the timestamping idea way before the Bitcoin white paper. So this is the basic mechanism on how to validate data integrity. This is also built on the uh, Merkle tree idea from Ralph Merkle. So there's basically a few ideas that came together and timestamping is one of those ideas that Bitcoin and blockchains are built on. Timestamping, digital cash, proof of work, Byzantine fault tolerance, public keys as identity, and now in the future we're going to have smart contracts and new use cases. So here's a few clips from our talk. So I split my time uh, three ways. One, I'm a partner at a venture capital firm and we invest in a particular segment of the blockchain space. Not because we don't like the other segments, but it's, it's the one area where we feel like we have some particular expertise and maybe a little bit of an edge. Two, we operate something called, and that's called Yugen Partners. Two, we have something called Yugen Labs where we feel like there's some ideas that we keep hoping to fund at Yugen Partners, but people haven't come up with them and we just can't wait. And so we're gonna try our hand at a couple of them. <laughs> and then third, Excellent. I spend probably a third of my time just trying to help uh, promote the general community. In other words, without any real thoughts about remuneration, just trying to be a little bit of a goodwill ambassador um, Particularly, I, you know, I, I just uh, joined uh, the European Union's expert panel on blockchain. I've been in conversation with the legislative agenda here in the United States. I, I'd like to do my part to kind of nudge uh, things in the right direction. And as I've said, um, speaking about that third area of involvement, I believe that well-informed light regulation is what we should seek rather than try to go at our own, you know, sort of divorcing ourselves from uh, the existing uh, governmental structure. But um, let me come back to the middle one. So mm -hmm. you can partners, you can labs, and then goodwill mm -hmm. ambassador. And we're looking at um, a couple of different initiatives that seek to leverage the whole value creation that peer-to-peer -peer systems and common, commonly held um, information and assets can bring. And so, um, for example, uh, one thing we're working on that is pretty far out, um, but you can take a look at its, its opening slide online, it's called the Gazillion Network, okay? And we chose Gazillion for a couple of reasons. One, we wanted to serve notice to Google that they were no longer the only large number in town. <laughs> and yeah. second, because if you go to the page and it's just spelled gazillion.network, um, uh, you know, in the United States there was, and in Britain, there was a popular game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Okay. <laughs> right. and, and our point is, well, if you think it's great being a millionaire, who wants to be a gazillionaire, okay? And a gazillionaire is um, not so necessarily someone that's particularly wealthy in their assets, but someone that buys into the notion that as they grow richer, they can help solve more of uh, the world's problems by finding ways to help other people come into that kind of um, meeting their basic needs and, and, and being able to be freed from the worst of economic concerns and start to create value. And so um, we invite people that are, that are interested um, in the Gazillion Network to take a look at that. Another thing that we're launching is uh, because we spend a lot of time in the working with startup companies we've started a kind of crowdsourced uh, information network about startup companies, a kind of Wikipedia for companies that are 
way too early stage to get a Wikipedia article, but where the idea is to provide an objective source of information that is created by a peer-to-peer -peer network and then placed on a blockchain so that you can't go and you know, rewrite your company history just because you didn't hit your quarterly goals or whatever, so that people get a more objective view of how startups are doing. And I think in, in a couple of ways, they embody, both of those examples embody, um, you know, what's going on with the fundamental drivers of value creation that have led to blockchain and Bitcoin, that peer-to-peer -peer nature and that shared um, store stuff. Wow. That's wow, excellent. Leo asked um, this, the thing about timestamping was that uh, nobody, nobody's ever cracked it, right? And it, so what he was asking why no one cracked it. <laughs> so to me, I'm assuming that his question is, you know, why is the fundamental foundation not something that breaks? Right, and right. Course, why is it unbreakable? <laughs> well, you know, I think there are two aspects to it. One, unlike um, some sort of key-based system, and obviously, you know, there's, there's the possibility of if somebody discovers the key, then it all falls apart, okay? Someone discovers the private key. Whereas with one-way hash functions, there's no concept of a key. There's no one in a privileged uh, position. But on the other hand, let's talk for a second about why it could fall apart. You know, many people okay. are happy to read the first paper that Stuart and I wrote and maybe read the first patent. But I sometimes wonder whether they're really reading all the papers because <laughs> one of our papers anticipates the fact that hash functions will in fact be broken and that there needs to be a carefully thought out system that allows the blockchain to remain evergreen even as the computing technology advances and makes it possible to find um, collisions at all or chosen collisions in the blockchain. Because if you, if you can compute chosen collisions with the hash functions, then the whole premise of the immutability falls apart. Right. But, yeah. and again, I just encourage people to read the fact that we we thought about that, we anticipated that issue, and that there are ways to, to continually um, refresh the system so that it never needs to be subject to the failure of a given hash function. Mm -hmm. So it could be broken, and it's important for people to think that through for the long term. Mm -hmm. I mean, we uh, just recently saw, what, two days ago, you know, Bitcoin's price did a little jerk in part because someone got concerned that there'd been a $25 double spend. Now, <laughs> you know, if you look at it in any objective sense, that the whole potential double spend there was a non-issue. But the point is, if people lose confidence in a system, rationally or irrationally, okay, it really creates fluctuations. And so if we hear, you know, next week, next month, next year, someone has found a way to compute collisions with SHA-256, even though it's premature, it can have an emotional impact in the marketplace. So all I'm saying is it's unbreakable in part because there are no keys, but it's also in unbreakable only if people are thoughtful about, first of all, I suggest they read that paper, but thoughtful about um, continuing to refresh the chain. And there are ways to do that. Right, right.
I mean, I, I very much think there will continue to be a proliferation of change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We try to find out what are the real value-creating value creating situations. It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, we're certainly not going to see Bitcoin go away in, in the near to midterm. But um, I, I think there's, we're in the kind of um, flourishing phase rather than the, of ideas and, and different not just different ways to solve the problem, but different use cases that suggest very different chains. So I think we're still in that phase. Yes, there's gonna be consolidation of things that fail, but I think we have not yet reached the point where we've really found all of the good use cases. Um, so I think we're still in that flourishing, uh, multiplying phase. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I what what are your thoughts on uh, on hyperledger? I, I I know some people that are building uh, use cases on hyperledger, um, you know, healthcare blockchains, and uh, you know, it seems like they would be a common, you know, source. Uh, what are your thoughts on on that chain? Well, again, um, we've. We certainly have looked at a lot of different chains. And when you're talking about Hyperledger, you're obviously also raising the permission versus permissionless spectrum of, of issues. Um, I think that it really um, comes down to finding compelling use cases, initially in very modest ways that fit a particular need and then seeing those grow into adjacent areas. I'm less of a fan of someone that just says, clean slate, I'm gonna write a brand new, totally new blockchain that solves all problems simultaneously. Obviously I'm exaggerating. Right. Um, and now, now that we've solved the hard technical part, now the users will just come. That I don't think is, is how things play out in the evolution of technology and product. It's much more that, you know, take something like eBay, which started out as just a way to trade, you know, hobby items like Pez dispensers and then Beanie Babies, and then grew into its broader implication. They didn't set up an initial platform that was for selling anything and everything. Even Amazon started with books, though I understand they had the long-term vision. And so I'm much more impressed with teams that have found a modest use case that is compelling and then on their success allows them to move into adjacent situations than I am with those who say, well, I have found the, the universal solution to the whole problem. Now all I need is my first customer. Um, I think that's a riskier, a, a, a riskier venture. I'm not saying it's not impossible. Okay, but um, I, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. Yeah. So, uh, as as you know, I, I heard the uh, Mashinsky talk and, um, you know, I just uh, got started to look into Celsius and I, you know, personally, I'm interested in the healthcare and stuff like that. Um, w would something like that work for like a healthcare savings uh, insurance hybrid? Well, again, there's a lot of innovation that we look at in healthcare, both a fraud prevention, as well as getting rid of some of the inefficiencies of the system. I certainly think it could be applied to some of those situations. But again, mm -hmm. and if you'll allow me just for a minute to sort of put on my venture capital hat, you know, is this <laughs> yeah. an investable opportunity? We, yeah. we really look for companies that genuinely understand what the specific problem is that needs solving. And then can say how blockchain can bring, can be brought to bear on that. I see. Um, and so, yes, I think healthcare is going to see um, substantial improvements. 
as we create basically a shared record with mm -hmm. adequate privacy protections. I don't see that as being a, a, a large stumbling block. Um, but I think it can apply not just to the monetary issues, right. but also to um, just a lot of the data exchange issues. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just hard to grasp unless you're really deeply into it, just all of the inefficiencies in the healthcare system. I'm not talking about fraud or, you know, malicious intent. I'm just talking about um, basic inefficiency. And yeah. I think, so I, I think it's a, it's an area right uh, for space. And again, I, since you mentioned Celsius in particular, let me just be clear. I, I am an advisor for Alex uh, Mashinsky and the Celsius network, as well as a new venture he's launched with his wife called USA Strong. So I, I just want to put that disclaimer out in case someone wants to assume that anything I say about that is just pumping. Uh, again, I don't have any real need to <laughs> pump things, but um, just full, full disclosure there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the, the, fundamentally in the case of Celsius, it's, the, it's that Al, Alex it has, uh, is, is a successful serial entrepreneur and one able to spot opportunities that others don't see and then execute. So yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Excellent, excellent, yeah. And, uh, you know, you know, Mashinsky, of course, he's executed and, you know, I've worked on different teams. Now, uh, you know, one of the questions that usually comes up in teams is um, the Pareto principle where you've got, um, you know, maybe um, not everybody <clears throat> working at full potential, but is, is there a way to game theory, the Pareto principle in real life and in governance? I mean, because we have governance problems and is there, you know, cause you wanna get people involved and, you know, sometimes you just can't get the numbers, right? You know, um, I. I thought that was, I, I, I had a chance to look at many of your questions in advance as okay. I just want to make sure everyone is aware that's, that might be listening to a future recording. And I thought that question was one of the most interesting. Um, yeah. And quite frankly, I hadn't thought about it before, but I've thought about it a little bit since I, I read it. Okay. And I really think, um, to me, the short answer to that is yes, but only in the sense that it allows um, kind of multiple directions to flourish. Namely, on, only in the sense I think that it, if we can allow smaller entities to kind of break off and go their own direction due to the fact that we've made it easier for companies to function because we have a large shared system. I think that's the best way to see more people able to um, kind of flourish as individuals and get to exercise more choice. So that would be my answer to that. Interesting. It, it, that kind of reflects the Belcor um, I guess, structure, doesn't it? Where, you know, you look for a problem and then you kind of self-organize your own team. <laughs> yeah, again, it was, a, it was a great opportunity to work at some of these research institutions. You know, I, I got to experience a little bit of the uh, Xerox Park culture when I was at Stanford mm -hmm. and then the Belcor mm -hmm. culture. Um, Mm -hmm. And yes, it was, uh, you know, it was a, uh, an attitude towards management called uh, benign neglect. Namely, they thought <laughs> it was more important to try to hire the right people and then let them follow their nose okay. and sort of self-organize around challenging future problems than to be told top down what, what to work on. And it yeah. does allow for a real flourishing of, uh, of creativity. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, that's excellent. I, that's almost more like democracy or in action almost. Um, yeah, I think it's a good, it, it's a, it's sort of peer to peer community in action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, very so interesting. Talk about, let me shift to something, uh, an historical analogy and, and you may mm -hmm. Um, feel like I'm off, off, off the center line here when I do it, but I'll, I'll risk it. You know, a lot has been asked why we had the industrial revolution and the rapid rise of, you know, vast creation of wealth, why it initially seemed to center around Europe. Okay. And again, I'm not suggesting it's because, you know, some people are better than others. That, that's not my point. It's, it's a historical fact that we initially got that critical mass going, you know, in uh, Britain and the low countries and, and whatnot. And some have argued, and I'm inclined to, to see it, that the fact that there were a whole series of countries, none of which was dominant, but had more of a a, a balance of power and a kind of um, a, a, a sort of middle class of a collection of countries mm -hmm. is what allowed that that system to sort of go exponential first. And uh, uh, it, it may be that I'm just too prejudiced by what I'm, you know, what I've come around to thinking is is the issue but to me that's just a great example of how peer-to-peer -peer systems create more value mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. i'm sure if there's a historian listening now that well if there are two historians listening now one of them is agreeing with me and one is disagreeing but uh, <laughs> i put my money on peer-to-peer -peer. no i yeah i agree uh When you try to architect this machine, um, are there certain strategies or languages or um, things that uh, you would recommend for teams to to uh, look into? Maybe say uh, Scala or Rust, or is there any particular uh, strengths that you look at? Well, again, you know, I, I understand the argument about uh, these languages that mm -hmm. inherently are more provable and trustworthy or, um, you know, more analyzable. Mm -hmm. And that particularly comes into play um, as we see a rise in the whole smart contract issue. But mm -hmm. quite frankly, what we see as more important are some fundamentals that haven't changed over time. For example, okay, one thing that we ask about a management team is despite their technical brilliance, is there, are there people on the team that have experience selling into the very people that they hope will be customers? Um, that's kind of a pedestrian quality, you know, but right. it's right. so essential. Have, have you successfully sold stuff to the very people that you hope will buy your, your new thing? Right. And right, right. I, I don't mean it to come across the wrong way, but it, you'd be surprised how many people think that the strength of their technology alone is what will guarantee them success. <laughs> And right, right. it just doesn't play out that way. Um, there's such right. a learning curve to know how to create something valuable for a particular community. And right. the, the more people that we see on a team that actually know what that community is like and what they want because of previous experience, to me, that's, that's more important than whether it's built, you know, in um, you know with solidity or or haskell or you know or or whatever it it really is okay yeah 
No, um, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, insights and um, all of uh, on behalf of the uh, Hong Kong community, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and uh, everything that, that you do. We can all get uh, fully virus free and we can get back to getting together uh, with okay. each other. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much. Meetings are growing a little stale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Special out of way.